How many people were at the last program, the introduction to Sefi Yeshayo, just so I get an understanding of what we're dealing with? Okay. And exploring Yeshayo should be very, very special because if you just think about our prayer book that we use, what are the sources in our Siddur? Our sources are, number one, the Torah, of course. Number two, the book of Psalms. So there you have the Torah and the Ketuvim covered. From, from all the Nevi'im, by far, the, lo- the greatest contributor to what we pray each and every day comes from the Sefer we're going to journey through this evening. Sefer Yeshayahu. Sefer Yeshayahu, for good reason, also is the great contributor to, to the Haftorahs. If you wanted to pick what Sefer the Haftorah is read from, and any given Shabbos, you pretty much had a 50-50 chance that it comes from Sefer Yeshayahu. Haftorahs tend to describe the salvation of the Jewish people. There are a few exceptions. And Yeshayo is it. And the chapter we're going to look at this evening and explore tonight is probably the harshest chapter in all of Tanakh. And that's why it's read in Shabbos Chazon, the Shabbat immediately before Tisha B'Av. This particular chapter we're going to explore is so challenging, is so difficult. Listen very carefully. When I read a Haftorah in public of Isaiah chapter 1, I literally sometimes have to pause and halt because I can't even get through it. And it's meant that way. It was shaped that way by this great prophet of God. A man whose prophetic career expands from the time of Uziyahu Azariah, who happened to have been Yeshayahu's first cousin, all the way to his son, to Yotam, an enormous amount of time. Uziyahu, this great king who lived 2,700 years ago, at the time was the longest reigning king in the entire Davidic dynasty, 52 years. 27 years into his kingship, there was a, 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 an event that's marked not only here in Isaiah, but it's marked in Chronicles, it's marked in Amos. It's the famous earthquake that Zechariah refers to in chapter 14. We're a great king. If you ever go to Eilat and wonder how did the Jewish people ever get to have this town in our hands, it was Uzio, who was a great conqueror, but he made an error in his life, and that is he brought Ketoret in the base of Middash, which was completely forbidden. It caused an earthquake, and that triggers Isaiah's career. It's that explosive event in Isaiah chapter 6. This first chapter is not chronologically the first chapter of the book of Isaiah. One of the things I mentioned last time, and I must repeat it again because too many people weren't here, is that there is not even a, there's not a shemis, there's not even a hint of any chronological order in Sefer Yeshayo. The same thing goes for Sefer for the book of Jeremiah, Yermio, and the book of Ezekiel. But at least Yechesko, Ezekiel, at least Jeremiah, when it opens, when you open chapter 1, verse 1, at least in those two other books, those really are the first events in the prophetic career of those great men. Isaiah, that's not the case. And when we get to Isaiah chapter 6, where our Kedusha comes from, Kadosh, 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 what is happening there? An explosion. That's the event, the explosion, the earthquake takes place because Uziyahu misappropriated his role. He was from Malchus David, and only a Kohen could bring Ketoret. Only a Kohen could bring incense. Those of you who wish to study this in greater depth, I encourage you, I implore you to read Second Chronicles chapter 26. Where all the events that we're going to be talking about are described. And in fact, the book of Chronicles, the authorship is who? Who wrote the book of Dereyomim? Yeah. Is? Dereyomim. Really important. Dereyomim is written by Ezra. Mm. It's very important to know that because Dereyomim is not interested in the mistakes of the Davidic dynasty. Who is Ezra speaking to? Who is his audience? When did Ezra live? At a very critical time. Ezra lived at the very beginning of the Second Temple period. In fact, his father, if anyone knew the name of his father, I would be shocked. 
But Tzintanach, his father, his name was Saruya. His father was killed when the first temple was being destroyed. He was the last Kayin Gadol, the high priest of the first temple. Ezra is very important. You can't approach Tanakh, Kindlech, listen very carefully. You cannot understand this holy book unless you understand the historical context in which they were written and who was their audience. Remember this, that the way books were canonized by Chazal, how did you get included into this holy book? Well, two things have to happen. I'm not talking about the Torah now, because the Torah initially was written for all generations forever. But there were more than a million men and women who were prophets in our history. How did it wind up that these are the books that made it and others were not? And what is most critical is two stage. It was a, a two-stage method of identifying what went in. Number one, and most important, it had to be the Word of God. It had to be written by a Navi. Most important. Number two is if the Navi was writing and preaching, but what he was speaking about, what she was teaching, was not nitnu lodiris, which means had no relevance to future generations, it did not make it in Tanakh. The only thing that made it in Tanakh is those things in here that mean something to us today in Yerushalayim. If it meant nothing to future generations, but it was only relevant to that generation, it was not included in the canon. And it's very, very important. Ezra is writing at the beginning of the temple period. He doesn't make Aliyah with the first wave that comes in, Tarek Yisrael, 42,360 Jews. He's, he, doesn't, he comes in a little bit later on because he stays back in Bavel, caring for his Rebbe Baruch ben Nuriya. Who is that? He's a disciple of Yirmiyahu. Ezra is speaking to Jews who had just... When I say made Aliyah, moved to Israel, it's not like there's a Jewish agency, there's no nefesh ben nefesh, there is nothing. And there is nothing. There's just a promise from Cyrus who says, Jews, you can go back. Isaiah 44, verse 28. Look at that, it's all here. 45, verse 1, 45, verse 13. That's how the book of Ezra opens. The book of Ezra opens with this call from Cyrus. In fact, we're not even introduced to Ezra until we get to chapter 7 of the book of Ezra. I'm not making this up. So when Ezra is writing, he's not interested in talking about the sin of Bathsheba. You know about that already. You've read 2 Samuel. We're not interested in talking about the inappropriate conversation with Abigail. We're not interested in any of that stuff. We're interested in knowing that although it looks like we don't have a king, and there was no Davidic king during the Second Temple period, the Davidic dynasty is going to continue. That's why the genealogy that people don't read in Chronicles is so focused on chapter 2 on the Davidic dynasty. It's going on. This is, without knowing this, you really can't even approach it. The key is that in chapter 26 of Second Chronicles, there we have a description of the events that occurred that triggered the earthquake. And the very end of it, this is so delicious, the very end of this chapter, again, Second Chronicles chapter 26, if you want to know more about the story, it's a slight paraphrase, if you want to know the back end of the story, read Book of Isaiah. Those of you who study Tarach know that, that that is very rare. It is extremely unusual for one prophet to quote another prophet. It happened, except for Moshe Rabbeinu, with that exception. Very, very unusual. It's very rare. It would be very difficult for anyone in this room, I would think, to come up with more than one or two examples of that. It's rare because it's not relevant. Therefore, my friends, listen carefully. When you come to a passage in the Novi and you don't know how this is relevant to me today, that means you don't understand it. That's the key point. That means you don't understand it. Tanakh, what does that word mean? What is Tanakh a reference to? Right. Tanakh is an acronym for three parts of the Hebrew scriptures, the Torah, the Nevi'im, and the Ketuvim, the writings. Now, we all understand the Torah and why that would have a unique status. It was written letter for letter, exactly what God conveyed to Moses. It was written a priori for all future generations forever and ever. 
Tairus Hashem Tamima Meshiva Sonovish. The Torah of God is perfect. It alone could restore the soul. Edus Hashem Ne'amono Machkimas Pesi. The testimony of God is trustworthy. It alone can make the foolish wise. Psalm chapter 19, verse 7 and verse 8. So I get why Torah would have its own category. Kindlech, I'm asking you this. Why is it that we have these two categories of the Nevi'im and the Ketuvim? Why do we have that separation? Is it artificial or is there something really important? The difference is the following. The Nevi'im are there once you have the Torah, which is the guide. Torah means teaching. Just a side point, the word Torah in Tanakh way more frequently is used, meant for the word teaching rather than the Torah as in the five books of Moses. The Torah is there to tell you this is the guide how to live your life. The Nevi'im are pregnant with one type of message, and that is, this is how you can mess up. That's the key. The key to all the Nevi'im is they want to write about what you could be doing wrong in your life. And here's examples of people who messed up, and it is every sin, every misdeed, every just mistake that people could make is there in the to show you this is what you can do wrong. This is how you can make a mistake. There is no chapter in Tanakh that expresses this and conveys this more vividly than the chapter we are about to delve into. Okay? By the way, Daniel, why didn't Daniel make it into the Nevi'im? Why is he in the Ketuvim? Another thing really important about Daniel, he's never preaching to Jews. I know this sounds crazy, but he's never preaching to Jewish people. There are almost no Jews in the book of Daniel, aside from his companions, who we are introduced to early on in Daniel. Once they leave the stage, he's talking to Gaim all the time. You know, when Christians argue, well, the New Testament was written by Jews, for Jews, blah, blah, blah. There's all Jews, Jew, 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 all over the place. I don't care if it's full of Puerto Ricans. It makes no difference. The question is, is it the word of Hashem or not? They just didn't, Jews and not Jews. So, and this is... And therefore, if the Nevi'im are there to show you this is what you're doing wrong, this is how you are messing up completely in your life, this is every possible error that you can make, what then are the Ketuvim? Listen very carefully. What are then the writings? This is how to get it back. We had a huge fight. We nearly broke up yesterday. Let's make up. This is the Ketuvim is the antidote. The Ketuvim is the medication. Open up a safe to Hillam. Come back to me and I'll return to you. So the Ketuvim are there as the answer to the Nevi'im. And that's why they're divided exquisitely. Our wisdom literature, three of the, Sfarm, three of the books written by King Solomon of Blessed Memory. These are all telling you how to dial it back and how to return back from all the mistakes that are in the Nevi'im. By the way, does the church like this? They can't stand this arrangement. Why? This is just an aside. Why would the church find this objectionable? Because, right, because they do not want the Ketuvim, the writings, to be the answer to man's problem. They want the book of Matthew to be the answer to man's problem. If you're a sinner, go to the book of Luke. If you've fallen away from God, go to the book of Romans. If you've fallen away from God, go to the book of John. They want the Christian Bible. They want Calvary. They want Golgotha. They want the cross to be the answer. What will the church then do? They don't just leave it there. What will they actually do? You're not, I'm pretty sure you're going to believe what I'm about to say, but you're going to go, I can't believe it. What would they do if they wanted to undo that? They can't have the solution, the ketuvim. That is not a good shidduch. They have to rather do what? They have to? It's really very simple. Thank you. They have to change the order. And therefore, they have to literally put the ketuvim before the neviim and literally buried in there, so, yes, wow. And this didn't happen in the first century. I'm not gonna go into this, I don't wanna, I'm usually speaking about Christianity in some major way, but I really, really want to learn Yeshua tonight, but if I didn't say this, and I'll be doing this in our future Isaiah programs, we're going through the Sefer Yeshua, I'm gonna mention these things. This is not first century Christianity. They didn't even think of this, but they eventually did it. We know that because in the Christian Bible, in the book of Luke, 
as an example, chapter 24, verse 44, it tells us the order of the text. The Torah, the prophets, and the, the book of Psalms, which always represents the, the two of them. So this is an invention that the church doctors came up with. Well, how do we get away from this? And that's why the order of books is different in a Jewish Bible than in a Christian Bible. The Protestant church believes that in all our 39, which are really 24 books, they all believe that's the, that's the word of Hashem. Wow, yeah. Verse 1. Chazon Yishayo ben Omotz. Asher Chaza al Yehud of Yerushalayim. This is the vision of Yeshayahu, the son of Omotz. That mention of Omotz is really important because Omotz had a brother, and his brother was Amatzia. And Amatsi is the father of Uziyahu. Yeshayo was Davidic dynasty royalty, and that's why Yeshayo is going to be speaking to the kings and in and out of the in and out of the palace. Asher Chaza al Yehuda of Yerushalayim, the vision that he saw on Yehuda and Jerusalem. Well, what do you mean Yehuda and Jerusalem? What do you mean by that? Because Yeshayo was preaching here, where we are right now. Well, we are literally right now, this is where Yeshayo and Micha HaKadosh Vator were preaching during their prophetic career. While they're here in the southern kingdom, there was a northern kingdom that had split up years ago, split away after the death of King Solomon. There are other prophets that are there to serve the northern kingdom. Famous ones, Hosea lived at the same time, Amos, became a prophet only two years before Isaiah did. How do I know? Amos chapter 1, verse 1, mentioning the earthquake. So Yeshayahu was very concerned about Yerushalayim. Bimei Uziyahu, in the days of that great king, Yotam, his son, Yotam was a mamash tzaddik. Yotam was the only Davidic king that never sinned. Ahaz rules for 16 years, possibly the worst Davidic king, and then Yechizkiyahu, a tzaddik. Yechizkiyahu ruled for 29 years. So Isaiah's prophetic career was fantastic. Malchei Yehuda, kings of Yehuda. I, I want to show you something really quite exquisite. We are going to encounter in the coming chapters where Isaiah is speaking to almost all these kings. We are in the coming programs, as we go through the book of Isaiah, we're going to have a lot of where Isaiah is speaking to Uziahu. He's going to be addressed. We have a lot of, a lot of material where Yeshayahu is speaking to Ahaz. Very, very wicked king. And there's an enormous amount of interaction between Isaiah and and Chizkyo. Chizkyo would turn out to be Isaiah's own son-in-law. Isaiah would give Chizkyo his daughter in marriage. The person who is never having a conversation conveyed in Tanakh is Yotam. And this will help you understand this. Yotam, we mentioned, is a person who never sinned. And it says in Tanakh, the man just never sinned. He did everything that was right in the eyes of the God. Remember what I said from the beginning I'm almost like giving you algorithms here so that you, the tool, so that you can then figure out what's going on. Of all those four kings, who would be the king who would never be recorded as ever having a conversation with the Navi? The answer is the king who just doesn't do anything wrong. Nothing wrong, then we have no conversation, we have nothing to talk about because it doesn't fit into the Nevi'im. You see how... You see how delicious this is? This is what I want to do with you. I, I, we can't go through every chapter, but I want to show you how powerful this is. Verse 2. Shimu shamayim v'hazini oretz. Listen, O heavens, and give ear, O earth. Ki Hashem diber, for God is speaking. Bonim gidalti, I raised children. Romanti, and I raised you up. And you, despite that, you were bonimatem la shemulekechem. You were a mamleches kohanim, Exodus chapter 19. You were there, you experienced it. I made a dry pathway through for you to part of the sea, and you sinned against me of all people? You, the mamleches kohanim? You have done this? By the way, when you hear these words, 
שימו שמיים והזיני ארץ, right? Listen to heavens and give ear to earth. What do you should be thinking about? So what does that sound a lot like? Yes, sir. This is loaded, pregnant with the song that Moshe Rabbeinu, blessed memory, delivers in the chapter 32 of the book of Deuteronomy. What does that mean? Hear, O heavens, give ear, O earth. What does that mean? What is that like? What, what, what is that? I mean, it's, it's great, you know, it's great poetry, but what is it? We're not interested in poetry here. What, is it, what does that mean when Isaiah is calling it heaven and earth as witnesses? Yes. Like it says in Yermiyahu, uh, you know, if the, uh, if the earth were in Yermiyahu chapter 31, if the, if like the season were to change, if the heavens and the earth were to stop. So says the Lord who created the sun to illuminate the day, the stars and the moon to illuminate the night. If these would ever pass away. If the very foundations of the earth can never be measured, so do will I, so too will I toss away the seed of Israel from being a nation before me. Israel cannot disappear. And the prophet Yirmiyahu is calling, saying, look around. Look around. Look at the natural phenomena. Go a little tighter with me. I want to tighten that up more. This is big because it's huge in Tanakh. I call heaven and earth as witnesses. Deuteronomy chapter 15, chapter 30, verse 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, and 19. Huge. What does that mean, I call heaven and earth as witnesses? This is what makes Judaism different than any other religion in the world. If you're God, what can you control? And if you're not God and making it up what you can't control? Well, I'll give you some examples. If you're really God, you can control the weather. You can make it stop raining, and as a result, you take a look at the other witnesses, and that's the land, it will clamp up, and you're not going to eat. If you're not God, it's really not a good idea to put that in your religious book, because you can't make it happen. But if you can make it happen, as it says in the Teich, uh, in Leviticus chapter 26, I will make your sky like iron and your land will be like bronze. That tells us, if you're making up the religion, you say, ah, you're going to go to hell if you don't believe. <laughs> you're going to burn in hell forever. That's the perfect one. I know there are people here who are loaded. <laughs> and there may be people sitting in this room, but not so much, right? But if you want to make a lot of money, religion, this is a very good field. All right. But if we're making up a religion, the one thing you're not going to do is saying, look, if you don't obey my religion, it's just not going to rain. And it's not going to rain, and then nothing's going to happen. It, don't dare do that. And don't dare do that in the land of Israel. Why? Because Israel really needs the rain. It doesn't rain all year round, as it does in, in New York. It doesn't make a difference. It, here, we need those rains which we pray for when it can possibly rain. That's when we make that bakosha when it can rain. We are not Mitzrayim. Mitzrayim is the serpent where it's got a Nile all the time. And it doesn't need rain, and it doesn't get rain because it's in the middle of the largest desert in the world. And it don't need it because we got a great river that's very, very consistent. We've got all the food we want, and we could ship it out all over Europe, which the Egyptians did. Okay. So the key is that when the Torah is saying, saying, I am calling witnesses, that means I am calling the natural phenomena, these are the witnesses of what's happening. You have sinned against me. And that's why the words are used. Look at this, it's so beautiful. Shimu shamayim vazini eretz. Ki Hashem diber. It's right there. Now you might just read, smoke right through that and go, ki Hashem diber. No, it's because the heavens and the earth are the witnesses, you know now that God is talking. This book has to be a holy book. When this book, when prophet says, you're going to go into exile, 70 years, and then I'm going to bring you back, Jeremiah 29, verse 10. You know how long the Babylon Empire is going to last? 70 years, Jeremiah 25, verse 12. I can say it, why? Because I'm God. And if you're not God, you never want to make these kinds of predictions. But one day you're going to be exiled again from the land, and it'll be a huge exile, which we're enduring right now. But one day I'm going to bring you back, and we've returned. That's the God of Israel. This is the God who we worship. This is the only one who we bend our knees to. This is the only one we pray to. 
This is the only one that we raise our tongues to, only him. He is our Lord. He is our only Savior. We have no rock but him. When we say that, we mean that. And the book is not trying to scare you to death. That's why there are very few references to the resurrection in Tanakh. Very few references to what happens after you die. Rare. Why? It's unfalsifiable. You can't test it. What are you going to do? You're going to go to hell? That's very scary to people. People worry about what happens after they die. But what, how do you test that? You take a shovel and start digging in a cemetery? Harry, what happened? You can't do that. It's great. And therefore, it's amped up in the Christian Bible. In Tanakh, actually, the only reference to the resurrection of the Torah is in Parsha Sazinu. It's the only reference. But you have other references, but it's never presented in the form of a threat. It's just as you know that I will resurrect the dead. That's all. Verse 3. I want you to know how to understand these psukim. Yoda shor koinehu. An ox knows his owner. V'chamor evus bolov. And the donkey, he knows the troth of whoever owns him. Yisrael lo yoda, ami lo hispaninon. Animals know. But you don't even understand. And that term of knowing and understanding is going to mark right through Yeshayahu. I hope you'll join me for as we move through Yeshayahu. Atem Eidai no Mashem, you are my witnesses, declares the Lord, my servant who I have chosen, Laman Teidu Seishno. The Saminu and understand, Kanihu, that I am God. Before me there was no God created, and the Loyah Achra, and none will be after me. That's Isaiah chapter 43, verse 10. I hope they hear me in the Vatican. They hear those words of Yeshayahu. But it's, it's very, very powerful. Yoda, you know, it's interesting. In the Torah, there's an isu de araisa, there's a prohibition in the Torah to yoke a, these two animals together. This is not stum where they threw it in like two animals, beasts of burden, are, just happen to be in the Pusik. Deuteronomy chapter 22, verse 10. It's forbidden to have a yoke pulled by a shur and a chamor. Also to do that. Can't mix them. What's going on here? This is so a shur, an ox, this cattle, they really can have a relationship with their owner. They really care about their owner. They know their owner. And they could be trained and they're very responsive to their owner. They care about their owner. That's the nature. They, they, there's a kesher form with the owner. There was a Jew who sold his, his cow to a goy. The goy buys the cow, and suddenly on Shabbos, the cow doesn't want to work. The guy is enraged. What's going on here? What kind of a cow did you sell me? <laughs> he goes back to the Jew. And he says, what, what kind of a cow did you sell me? The cow doesn't, won't, didn't work on Saturday. The Jew says, take me to the cow. said to the cow, listen up. When you worked for me, when I owned you, I couldn't make you work on Shabbos. You weren't allowed to work for me on Shabbos. But I sold you. He's not a Jew. You can work on Shabbos now. Imagine the guy who's watching this spectacle what is going on here? An animal knows to keep the Sabbath, and I don't have to keep the Sabbath? This remarkable event in the, this non-Jew's life caused him to rethink everything he knew about God. He was a Maguire. He became a Jew. 
and he became a Tano. And he's Rabbi Yochanan, then <laughs> Ben Toiroso, many of you know of him. He's a Tano, he was a contemporary of Rabbi Akiva. Ben Toiroso, it's a play on words. What does that mean, Ben Toiroso? That means he's a, son, he's a son of a cow, which means he's the disciple of the cow. The cow is what brought him to the God of Israel. The shore knows his owner. Imagine that. You know, there are people that can have a single experience in their lives. And for many of you sitting here, joining me here tonight, there was a single experience in your life that had brought you to the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. It's not that that was the only event, but it was that key point that just woke you up. The sure has a connection to the owner. That's why it says, Yoda Shar Koinehu. The sure really knows his owner. Now, Chamor is a little different. Chamor certainly is a beast of burden. But Chamor doesn't have a kesher, doesn't have a relationship with the owner. The only thing is he doesn't know where his food comes from. And whoever puts the food in the trough, in the manger, in the crib, that's it, I'll work for him. That's it. People don't have all these relationships with their donkeys and so on. So a donkey, you, what the Navi is saying here is so loaded. He's saying, not aren't you cattle, you can't even do donkey. It means I feed you, I make it rain, I make it so that you can live, I brought you out of the wilderness, I give you even a donkey. A donkey would understand that language and you don't get it. You can't even do donkey. I know I'm skipping a little bit here, but I'll, I'll do it with you. You're talking about, I wanted to show you how I explained the last time we were together, the Yishayohu, 90% of Yishayohu, the language is this, I don't like the word poetry because it's not real poetry in any contemporaneous sense, but this biblical poetry, there are a lot of plays on words and every word is pregnant with meaning. Pregnant with honey, so delicious. I want to show you how extreme this becomes, but I want you to listen for the language here. Um, verse 9, just for a moment. If God would not have set aside just a small number, a little group of you to remain, which is a promise, you can't disappear, you would have been like Sodom. The Amora Dominu, you'd have been just have the same fate as Amora, meaning God disappeared, finished. What was the sin of Sodom? What did they do wrong? What was the main miscarriage of justice? Right, there was no justice. That was the key. If you remember the delicious soliloquy, well, after Avroma Vinu encounters three angels, Hakodesh Baruch Hu begins to speak almost to himself, and he says. What should I do? Here I have Avram Avinu, unlike Sodom. He's righteous, and I know he will lead his family in Sodoka and Mishpat. How can I withhold what I'm about to do to Sodom, which lacks any Sodoka, lacks any Mishpat? Sodoka, in this sense, doesn't mean literally charity. Sodoka means righteousness, just. Most of the times the word Sodoka is used in Tanakh, it doesn't mean as we contemporarily use the word as interchangeable with charity. It means being just, being right. Same words. Listen to the listen to the next verse. Shimu devar Hashem kitsine sedoim. Listen to the words of Hashem, you chiefs of sedoim. Vahazinu teres eluhenu am amora. You hear those same words used over again. You know we we can. You talk about physical witnesses of what happened to a place where there's no justice. We could travel, would take about, wouldn't take long at all, and we could be in the Dead Sea area. If I blindfolded you, you'd know you're there as long as the windows were open. Because you could smell the sulfur. It's not unpleasant, but it's very, very striking. Now, you, you can tell you're going down because we're some, I guess, some 900 meters above sea level. The Dead Sea area is some 460 meters below sea level, so your ears might be popping. But other than that, 
you could smell, it's still there. And in fact, uh, scientists have studied the area, this whole region of Sodom and the Dead Sea, and just go back to that time, just dial back time, just thousands of years, and there was lush wilderness there. Bang. It's there, it remains as a, a staggering witness to what happened. But you, you are, you are Sodom? That's like the most explosive accusation. I mean, at this point you feel, but, but I'm keeping things. I'm, I, I'm bringing sacrifices. I'm bringing offerings. God says, I don't even want them. And you can keep your sacrifices and offerings. I am filled with them. They stink to me. I don't need your fat of ram. This is a theme not only here in Yeshayo, it is all over in the Novi. You think your sacrifices will save you? You think your new moons will save you? You think when you raise your hands to me and wave them in prayer, you think I'm going to listen to you? I don't want it. I want nothing to do with you. But what does it mean? Jeremiah, a blessed memory, chapter 7, verse 21, when he's excoriating the Jewish people who did not believe that the first temple could be destroyed. Just so you know, Jeremiah is loaded with a single man, a prophet, a very young prophet, he becomes a prophet at 15 years old, who is telling the nation, you don't get it. Babylon is going to destroy this temple, is going to destroy you. Do not go to war with Babel. God is not going to step in there. Be quiet. Babylon only has 70 years. So if you just shut up and remain, you don't have to go through what's about to happen. That's where, by the way, the Jeremiah 25, 12 comes in. That Babylon only has 70 years which Daniel is going to misunderstand because he's going to conflate it with the other chapter in Jeremiah 29, verse 10. If you just quiet, just don't fight because God is not on your side. And the Jews are responding, but we have the temple. Hechel Hashem. We have the temple of the Lord. And Jeremiah says, are you out of your mind? Stop screaming the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord is in the temple of the Lord of this. Forget your sacrifices. Put them on your meat and eat flesh. It means nothing. When did I command you with such sacrifice when I took you out of Egypt? Verse 21. Hosea chapter 6. This is all an explosion against the Christianity with this is all amped up. You need the blood, you need the blood. Without the blood, you can't the blood, the blood, the blood, the blood, the blood. No! The Christianity invented nothing. It borrowed everything. It simply imported this idea that if you have this kind of um, transactional relationship, you don't get it. The whole sacrificial system was only the means. It's not the ends. The carbon comes to the word to come close. You don't get that? You don't understand that? And if you're cheating on me, then I don't want your chocolates. If you're text messaging with your ex-boyfriend, I'm not interested in getting any Hallmark cards. from. None of this means anything. Of course, in the proper context, it's wonderful. But if you're disloyal to me, all these things you're doing, they're grotesque to me. Your sacrifices, I, I don't want it. Keep it. If there's no justice, if there is no mishput in your lives, keep it. I'm filled with them. I'm satiated. It's grotesque. King David, of course, is famously atones for his sin by saying, I sinned against the Lord. Two words in 2 Samuel chapter 12, verse 13. And he writes about this. God is one sacrifice, once the broken heart, the contrite heart, Psalm 51, where Hashem Sifasai Tiftach comes from. And once you do that, then all these offerings will be very desirable to me. So, Imagine you've just heard this. Imagine you've just heard, you're like Sodom, you're like Amora, you are lower than an animal, so you're lower than a donkey. You don't even know when someone's taking care of you, and I don't want what you're doing. At this stage, you probably feel like, now imagine, you know, you, you've heard Sad and Shul before Tisha B'av. you're listening to this, you've done this, I know, and you hear this to the tune of Echa, that's how this is read in the shul. Imagine how you feel. This is preparation. And at that point, you pretty much might feel like many do. That is, I'm done. How am I going to ever get back from this? Will God ever want anything to do with me? And the answer is, let's talk. And that's where Isaiah chapter 1, verse 16, 17, and 18 take off. I want you to know this. Take care of the weakest members of society. Take care of the orphan. Care for the widow. Fight for her. Fight for the weakest members of society. 
And then Yeshayahu says these words, you all heard it, come, let's reason together. So just like what you're falling literally under the weight of these words, he says, let's talk about this. Let's just talk this whole thing through. Talk, you just finished telling me I'm the worst person in the world. If you do those things, although your sins are red, they're like crimson, I will make them as white as snow. Although they are so deeply, they're, they're scarlet, I will make them all. I will take you home. Would you come to me? I will return to you. And I will restore Jerusalem only if Jerusalem will, could be redeemed only through justice and righteousness. And that's how the chapter ends. The only way we can bring it back is justice and righteousness. It's taking care of the weakest members of society. I'll share just this one thing and I'm going to take your questions. I don't think I ever shared this before. I will now. There's a, a, a Mishnah in a tractate, in a Masech, that's very, it's not well known. It's called Masech des Yodayim. There really is such a Masech. And it's, the, it's, a, it's a devoted to the laws of really Tum of Atahira, what's clean and unclean. Jews were doing something that was not really a good idea, and that is that they had truma, they had sacred food that had to be given to the coin. And they just wanted to make sure no one went near it. And they would put it together with their sforim, with their scrolls. They would put them together in the same urn together. Mice and rats were undiscerning. And when, as they were eating through the truma, they would also take a bite in a parchment. And therefore, Chazal made a declaration that the, the, the holy books of the Navi actually make the hands impure. So therefore, if you take a scroll and touch it to truma, the, the truma is, becomes impure, and you can't do that. Okay? And then there's this argument that breaks out on the canonization of the Book of Song of Songs. She, is the Song of Songs, does it belong in the canon of Tanakh? Now, they weren't disagreeing or concerned about whether it's the Word of God or whether it's Nitin or whether it was relevant to future generations, but one thing. The Book of Song of Songs is written using extraordinary language, romantic language, sometimes erotic languages to describe the relationship between God and Kal Yisrael. <coughs> and the two main characters is a man who's God and a woman who's the children of Israel. And Chazal will worry that people will misunderstand this book and think it's a romance book, a poetry. And we could see that Rabbi Kiva stands up and he says, Chas v'shalom. So his words, he says, heaven forbid this should be the case. While the Torah is holy, Shir Hashim is the holy of holies. Why Rabbi Kiva? Why did he recognize the value of the relationship of the man and the woman as something that's in, un, so deep to understand our own relationship with God? Who was Rabbi Kiva? Himself a Baal Tshuva. Himself a person who disliked religious Jews. What transformed him? He met a woman. Her name, Rachel. Her family, the wealthiest family in Jerusalem. She transformed him. And he became Rabbi Akiva, the, the, the Rabbi Nshal Yisrael, the giant of Kal Yisrael, because of an extraordinary woman in his life who said, go study Torah. And therefore, Shir Hashim is the perfect way to convey the true relationship between God and Israel. Let it be that that relationship in your life could bring you to the place of the close place with HaKadosh Baruch and let us witness the coming of the true Mashiach, the Meherah B'Yameinu. Thank you, Johnny, Elisheva. Thank you. Good night. <laughs> יציר נברא ואת נסע בחף צוקו אזי מלך, אזי מלך שמו נקרא ואחרי כיכלו את הכל לבדו ימלוך נורא והוא היה